I have some sad news to report. A small puppy, not unlike Lassie, was just run over in the parking lot. <gasps> and now it's time for the comedy stylings of Homer Simpson. Are you ready to laugh? The poor dog. I said. Are you ready to laugh? <laughs> oh, quiet, you awful, <laughs> awful man. <laughs> Hello and welcome to OSW Review, the old school wrestling video podcast. Filmed in glorious grapple vision and encoded with blast processing, we chronologically critique wrestling storylines pay-per-view by pay-per-view. This is your host, your boy, Jay Hunter. Joined as ever with Mr. Rosie. All right. And V1. All right. Well, I just heard the news today. It seems my life. It's going to change. It's the first ever ECW pay-per-view, and we welcome Barely Legal 97. We love Battle for <laughs> They're tuned out, that's it. <laughs> 17 million homes that have availability for this show tonight. They will pay $20, hopefully, for the privilege to see you guys do what you have done for three and a half years. Thank Terry Funk for all he's done for this company, for help putting us on the map, for being unselfish in selfish times, for taking the young guys and showing them a better way. Tonight we have a chance to say, yeah, you're right. We're too extreme. We're too wild. We're too out of control. We're too full of our own shit. Or we have a chance to say, hey, fuck you, you're wrong. Fuck you, we're right. Because you have all made it to the dance. Because believe me, this is the dance. Yeah. Woo, woo, woo. Start the show! Welcome, Noggers! Happy days are here again! Boys. <laughs> you just sandbags it. I know, you just Every you time. do it. <laughs> We've been pushing you through were, it. You were not allowed to say what bar for this entire review. Well, Sandbag is what bar. Just as well that it's going to be me who's doing the matches then, isn't oh. it? So we'll, so we'll probably be asking you. Fang balls. <laughs> <laughs> Before we start, do not search for Barely Legal at work. <laughs> you may just get the 2011 Asylum sex comedy, but probably the penetrative hustler video coming of age porn series. Splicey splicey. <laughs> not splicey splicey. <laughs> If you're watching this, then we've sorted something out in the wake of the YouTube purge caused by the fucking WWE Network launch. It's insane. I'm still gonna get the network as well. Are you? Yeah, me too. Are oh, you mad? It's the oh. greatest bargain ever. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> you fucking arsehole. <laughs> now I've heard of it, I just... What's the bargain? Ten or a month for everything. Ever. Uh, every pay-per-view. Every pay-per-view ever made, plus every pay-per-view from now on live in HD. It's and then new shit. <laughs> That's my $10. <laughs> you <laughs> should ask Virgil for his password. Look. Hey. Arquette Trilogy in the pocket. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed our Q&A mailbag session. A new saga is on the horizon. Over Christmas, we asked you what original ECW pay-per-view you wanted to see, and it was neck and neck, but in the end, Heatwave 98 won the poll with 34.7%, edging out Barely Legal 97 with 30.8%. Um, so we were set to do Heatwave 98, but thinking on it, it's pretty mean just to do one real ECW show and then go straight into <laughs> three of Vince's, Vince's fucking version. Uh, so we thought, yeah, fuck it, let's do both. So much like the women of Barely Legal, our ECW review has split into two. <laughs> ECW's first ever pay-per-view, and then their highest rated show, their X7, if you will, before cracking WWE's revival. 
um, just fears that will shit on ECW. Fretchy enough, as we're practically in the same boat as the WWF fans were in 97, where Barely Legal would be their first real taste of ECW. I also think it'd be kind of cunty of us to complain about like unprotected chair shots and that, because that's the gimmick of ECW. That's uh, We're going to try to enjoy ECW for what it offers. I never agree to this. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just cut that bit. <laughs> Besides which, aren't we all Paul Heyman fans? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, big time, big time. No Shane Douglas guy, though. I can tell you that much. <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're old and your shit. <laughs> So with that in mind, before all that, let's bring everyone up to speed with a brisk jaunt through the history of ECW. It all started when Shane Douglas... (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Fuck! In 1992, mainstream American wrestling, WWF and WCW, was hit very hard. The steroid trial had decimated the WWF. There was a muscle mass exodus following SummerSlam 92. And as their stars shut up, <laughs> and as their stars disappeared, so did attendances, TV audiences, and pay-per-view orders. In the coming years, WWF had clung to the Hulkamania era, rebuilding a new Hulk Hogan in the form of your boy, Lex Luger, and filling their show with neon-clad cartoony characters like Aldo Montoya, Quang, (laughs) (laughs) and Make a Difference Fatu. (laughs) Much like Mantor's loincloth, it stank smelly butt. WCW aped WWF's sugary, child-friendly television and were seeing the same disastrous results. In early 92, that same year, Todd Gordon picked up the pieces from Joel Goodhart's failed Tri-State Wrestling Alliance and christened it Eastern Championship Wrestling. At the creative helm was hot stuff Eddie Gilbert, who booked himself as top heel giving his family and friends jobs, modelling it after Jerry Lawler's USWA, so much so it was called Memphis North. Jim Crockett, the guy who owned WCW before Turner bought it, came knocking, and with it, membership to the NWA, the National Wrestling Alliance, i.e. national exposure and some financial security. But Gilbert hated Crockett, so he left ECW, and so his right-hand man, Paul Heyman, took charge. Gordon and Heyman contrasted sharply. While Gordon was happy being a small Philadelphia promotion, i.e. a big fish in a very small pond, Heyman wanted to expand. Gordon respected traditional wrestling and ties to history, parading old-timers like Jimmy Snuka, and Don Morocco at, whilst Heyman wanted ECW to forge its own fresh and cutting edge identity. One, two, and three, and Shane Douglas has captured the National Wrestling Alliance World Heavyweight Championship. Crockett and NWA president Dennis Coraluzzo looked to strengthen ties with ECW on August 27, 1994, by crowning ECW Shane Douglas as the NWA champion. Swerving the audience, the wrestlers and the NWA itself, Douglas cut a scathing shoot promo on the NWA, threw down the title and with a brand new belt proclaimed himself the new ECW champion. It was a genius move. ECW both severed ties with the old traditionalist NWA and established its own renegade personality in the most attention-grabbing way possible. Only Heyman, Gordon and Douglas knew. Eastern Championship Wrestling was dead, and Extreme Championship Wrestling was officially born. This is the ECW Arena! In 1995, Heyman bought out Todd Gordon's share and fleshed out his anarchic vision for ECW. With acts like hip-hop white boys, The Public Enemy, Johnny Grunge, and Flyboy Rocko Rock, ECW was aimed at Generation X. ECW was marketed as this anti-establishment, bloodthirsty, hardcore alternative. It's your friend Cactus Jack bringing you tidings from World Championship Wrestling. 
He burned me, Mommy. He burned me bad. It's the first title that Cactus Jack has had in a long time, and indeed it is very dear to me. <laughs> Not anymore! Kane Dewey. Dewey Foley is a three-year-old boy. You sick sons of bitches! You ripped out my heart! You took everything I believed in and you flushed it down the damn toilet! You're not running this interview! I am! Cause I'm Brian fucking Bellman! Eric Bischoff is each and every one of these motherfucking smart marks rolled up in a one giant piece of shit! You know, that's where you're wrong, Mean Joy, because Steve Austin doesn't have what it takes to get it done in the ECW, brother. I was never allowed to reach past mid-card status in the WCW, brother. Right here on Monday Night, we'll bottle of Geritol on a pole match. First time ever in the world, you're going to see all the old codgers here in our organization. And they're going to be scrapping around and using their walkers, trying to keep the dentures in, and they're going for it. Eric, I love you, man. Take me back because I ain't got what it takes to get it done in ECW, man. So after settling a lawsuit with WCW, who erroneously also marketed a pay-per-view called When Worlds Collide, ECW were granted some WCW workers to use, namely Brian Pillman, Sherry Martell, and notably Mick Foley, aka Cactus Jack. ECW, the distant third competition, became a gateway for wrestlers to land jobs elsewhere. So, are you coming from Japan? Or recently fired from the WWF or WCW? Then work in ECW. Impress the right people and land a contract somewhere else. Boom! Back into the mainstream. Nice. World travelled wrestlers Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko came to ECW and immediately broadened its appeal. In addition to hardcore, ECW now added Chris technical mat wrestling to their arsenal. They got noticed immediately by WCW, who snapped them up. ECW then had to fill their gap with Conan, Rey Mysterio, Juventud and Psychosis, bringing Lucha Libre to America. WCW snapped them up. Ex-WCW Brian Pillman and Steve Austin had access to grind with WCW management and aired them in an ECW ring. Not long after, they both got jobs in the WWF. So you get this... ECW was constantly raided, you know, like Ring of Honor, where, you know, they'd have AJ Styles, Chris Daniels, Samoa Joe in 2002, TNA snap them up, they'd have... Brian and fucking Nigel. Yeah, and then you take them, <laughs> and so they make uh, Austin Aries, and he get, he goes as well, so they just got raided constantly. And then you're left with, like, Roderick Strong. Fuck off! <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's, it just struck me that in a short amount of time, in four years, already so much had passed. I remember asking people, hey, uh, what do you want us to review? Barely Legal, that's the first one, right? And I'd have, the, oh, this house show from 95. I was like, who is this cunt? And I was like, no, you're right. That's the one with Cactus Jack. That's the one with Stone Cold. Yeah, yeah. By the time Barely Legal rolled around, they're all gone. ECW were in this horrible spot of large enough to showcase talent, but too small to keep them. The other problem is that creating a blood-soaked, grungy product gained ECW a rabid, cult-like fanbase, but this was like 600 to 1200 fans per show, so like a few thousand fans scattered across America, talking like four cities, just like Philly, Florida, Chicago and New York. ECW was made on a shoestring budget but was always losing money. It needed to expand to a bigger market to compete. Since 93 they had a local cable slot in Philly but they needed to reach millions more. Fans who'd pay for the privilege, they needed pay-per-view. ECW was able to secure a pay-per-view deal, but the mass transit incident put that in jeopardy. So November 23, 1996, 17-year-old wrestling fan Eric Kulis lied about his age and experience and got a spot filling in for Axel Rotten in a tag match facing New Jack and Mustafa Saeed. Kulis said he was trained by Killer Kowalski, but even though Kowalski was backstage that night, they didn't ask him. 
<laughs> For fuck's sake. And Steve, uh, have you heard about the mass transit incident? I have, I have. During the match, mass transit, uh, he didn't know how to cut himself with the razor blade, so he decided to ask New Jack. And New Jack cut the shit out of his scalp. I, I, I don't like New Jack. I think he's the biggest scumbag the wrestling business has ever had. Ugh, it's disgusting. Mm. The horrific fountain of blood sprayed from Kulis' forehead, shocking the audience and wrestlers alike. Despite the wounds, whilst being carted out, Transit hilariously flipped off the fans, staying in heel character. That's awesome. awesome. He's a worker. <laughs> <laughs> Legally, did that cause much trouble? In the end, New Jack was tried with assault and battery and later sued by Kulis' family, but was acquitted as he asked New Jack to cut him. Ah... Uh... I can't understand why New Jack would do that, though. I mean, yeah. Because he's just, a scumbag. But why, why would you want to inflict pain on some innocent bloke? Because he's scum. Yeah. Despite the incident, the pay-per-view was still a go. It was never off the table. That's just Heyman spinning things. Just most pay-per-view providers weren't interested in carrying it. ECW had their rabid fan base and a roster packed with homegrown talent with an unparalleled work ethic. They could reach a potential 20 million through pay per view. So, after years of scratching and clawing, on April 13, 1997, in front of 1,170 of the ECW faithful, Extreme Championship Wrestling delivered their first pay per view special, Barely Legal. Pennsylvania, it's ECW's Barely Legal 1997. Joey Styles is in the ring and welcomes us to the landmark pay per view. Styles tries to run down the card but is interrupted by our first matchup. It's ECW tag champions the Dudley Brothers, Bubba and Devon, versus the Eliminators, Perry Saturn and John Cronus. These were wearing a lovely little uh, <laughs> pink and white get up. Sandbag him, Jay. So he won't do the pies. <laughs> How are you, Steve? <laughs> oh, oh. oh. oh he's itching to do it. <laughs> come on, come on. All oh, right, <laughs> Steve. What bar are the eliminators? Well, Jay, thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, the eliminators, their little man jocks are pink and white. So, of course, they are a pink and white. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just take off the wafer. <laughs> <laughs> And some of the Dudleys from Dudleyville, the same dudes and gimmicks that showed up in WWF in 2000. But there were many more Dudleys here in ECW. Uh, this was Raven's idea based on Paul Newman's Slapshot. Uh, with the Hanson brothers. So they're a comedy relief extended family with a common father, Big Daddy Dudley, who was a traveling salesman throughout the 60s and 70s and fathered a lot of these kids. And that kayfabe explained the differing physical attributes and races of the members of the Dudley clan. That'll do me fine. 
yeah, kayfabe is upheld. They'd have wrestlers fill in for the other Dudleys and Owie or Dudleys. So as long as you have a tie-dye tee, high tops runners, overalls, bad hair and taped glasses, you're in. So 10 in total. Holy oh. shit. So the patriarch, the unseen Big Daddy Dudley, accompanied by their heavy... Big Dick Dudley was the tag team of Dudley Dudley and Snot Dudley. That's right. Snot was injured and replaced with Dances with Dudley, the bastard <laughs> child of a Cheyenne Native American. That's an amazing name. Joined by Buh Buh, Ray Dudley, Fast Stuttering Hillbilly, and then Chubby Dudley, and Mute Sign Guy Dudley. Dances with Dudley got injured and was replaced with Devon Dudley, the only black Dudley. Devon convinced Bubba, Big Dick and Sign Guy to scoot the rest of the family out and turn heel. The last remaining face Dudley was LSD Little Spike Dudley, whose finisher was the Acid Drop. And I'm not counting Luke and Butch Dudley, who joined for one night in 98. Fuck up. <laughs> the Dudleys are seen here with Sign Guy Dudley and their shirtless, cheeseburger-loving lackey announcer, Randy. Sorry, Joel Gertner. They're defending their ECW tag titles against the Eliminators, Perry Saturn and Kronos. To start off, Sign Guy Pearl Harbors the Eliminators and eats their awesome tag finisher, Total Elimination. Total Elimination! Which is an awesome sweep and jumping roundhouse, high-low double team move, aka down and low kick and up, back and high kick. <laughs> <laughs> How awesome are these lads, by the way? Just fucking amazing. No. They were put over mega strong. Well, and I, I have positives about them. I, 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 I do have positives. Okay. Yes. F- I fully expected this. <laughs> <laughs> the show opened up with just problems everywhere. The microphones weren't working and you can hear like the sound tech guy going, it's not fucking working, it's not working, holy shit, shit, shit. And... Uh, I don't know if prior to going on air, they like begged the, the fans, just keep chanting, please. Just, you know, we don't need dead air or anything, but the fans really helped out. They were, they were fucking rabid. Like. What do you think of the ECW fans? They're awesome in the sense that they're 100% behind the company and the, the wrestlers, and they're very loud, but they're also really cunty. They're very quick to tell someone they fucked up when... You know, they really haven't really fucked up. They definitely helped or caused things to to turn nasty, you know, like there might be one chair shot and they pop for it, so they're so they're the reason for the really sick nasty chair shots. Good and the bad. Steve? I agree with most of that. <laughs> no, I agree with all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they're quite caring and loyal. Like they know everything about people as soon as they come in, but they're also huge smarky cunts. Mm. And smart mark comes from ECW, like tape traders, newsletter readers, and they've obviously watched enough WWF or WCW to reject it and go see this alternative. So, like they did make sure everyone gave their absolute all. If you notice this pay per view, there's there's like no rest spots mm. but that's a double edged sword it's great because you get high work rate but it means that the, the point of the rest spot is that the wrestlers can have a chat and work out the next sequence of moves so if you take that away they're just kind of going on the fly all the time so it means no psychology and it also builds of tension as well you know like if a person takes a nasty bump and they don't sell for it and they just get back up then you know you've taken said bump for absolutely nothing like what do you mean, no rest spots? Did you watch the Douglas match? Oh, you've fallen into my trap. <laughs> <laughs> One of the coolest things about ECW as well is that the fans are part of the show. They bring weapons and stop signs and mm-hmm. keyboards. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. To the show and the wrestlers would incorporate them into the matches and that's pretty awesome. As, as you, the point you made, it makes the wrestlers work hard. Because they re- they want to impress the fans. Mm. Whereas in WWE, they just seem to be going through the motions. Steve-O, why don't you take us through it, buddy? I will indeed. But uh, So the Dudleys uh, Pearl Harbor and Bubba hits a nasty Bubba bomb on Cronus. 
followed by a very nice uh, tilt a world slam. A nice suplex slash crossbody combo by the Dudleys. Uh, very nice. It was uh, Bubba Ray doing the suplex and Devon with the crossbody off the top rope. This is going to be a lot of moves from this point on, by the way. Not much psychology or story to be had. Elimination uh, hit more uh, spinny heel kick thingies. Billions of double moves. I have a list because it's no point in telling the story because they fucking didn't. We have uh, a pair of slams and some double twisting maneuvers. They both look shit. Very cool looking Saturn salt to the outside. It's like a, a cartwheel into a backflip moonsault move. Cronus uh, follows it up with a space flying Cronus drop. In other words, a springboard moonsault. Ah, it was pretty fucking cool looking, but it wasn't as good as uh, Saturn's move. Next up, Cronus does the really fucking terrible chick move. You know, the handspring elbow. China does that. Yeah. And Kelly Kelly does it. Are you having a laugh, John Cronus? And then that's followed up by a fucking lovely uh, big elbow by Saturn. Putting punks to absolute shame. More double sweeps and kicks. After this, we have yet more double kicks. <laughs> followed by... Total elimination. Total elimination! Cover! And we're... What did you think, think of the match, lads? Moves a core. Yes. Just, <laughs> yes, just, they do. Anyone just, say, listening to the audio of this will want to now go and watch that match. Saturn was great. He really was good in this match. But the other guy, you have to say, now, great I, as well. I wouldn't have much time for now. He was fucking deadly. He's quite a... Gi- they're just... There was no selling, there was no tagging, there was no match in this match. Like, this match would be like what a person playing a wrestling game would have their match like. I'm just going to hit all of the moves on you before I hit. Don't eliminate you! (laughs) By the way, I fucking hate that Joey Styles call when he does that voice. I despise it. Do you? Disgusting. Ah. Yeah. Get by! Get by! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> can't stand it can't stand it <laughs> although I think the rest of his calling is usually great I didn't enjoy this match at all um, yeah the Eliminators absolutely decimate the Dudleys with a flurry of signature spots and pin Bubba with total elimination at 6-11 one reason for this is that Bubba's broken ankle was still healing Okay. The other reason is, I think, start the pay-per-view off hot with a decisive tag title change. Like, at any pay-per-view, I'd happily have this kicking things off. The crowd... I was on the edge of my seat. I'm sure the fucking crowd were on the edge of their seat. And my comment was, what an awesome match. Fuck you and your psychology. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Joel announces the Dudleys as the winners and gets a total elimination for his trouble. He gets a what? Total elimination. Gets a what? Complete. Total elimination. (laughs) (laughs) And we get a good look at the ECW tag belts, which are rejiggered classic IC title belts. Mm Styles plugs the main event three-way dance between Sandman, Terry Funk and Stevie Richards, the winner getting an immediate world title match with Raven. He throws to a video package of Sandman getting over his beer-drinking, chain-smoking, cane-swinging, self-mutilating character. By the way, horrific promo. I have written here, big knacker with a smoke and (laughs) cut forehead. (laughs) Styles candidly informs us that Candido can't compete tonight since he tore his biceps. In ring, Candido, Mr. No Gimmicks Needed, cuts a Crash Holly Scrappy Doo style tough guy but scaredy cat promo whining about being injured. His no longer opponent, Lance Storm, enters the ring complete with a fucking dyed blonde rat tail. <laughs> Holy shit. It's Sp- bad, isn't Spot it? the carny. Yeah. If you're ever arguing with Landstorm, just say, dyed blonde rat tail. Yeah. I love the way Landstorm, though, came out to the ring, shaking his head at Chris Candido's promo. <laughs> it's so awful. 
And like, because Lance Storm can cut a better promo. Oh yeah, bubbling with charisma. Yeah. <laughs> Dyed blonde rat tail. Oh, it was so bad. Like that's the kind of shit we would have seen that like in the kind of early mid nineties in Ireland. In like, Mosnia. Like, yeah, in Mosnia. Do you remember the big fringe yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. I used to have really big I fringe. fucking bet you did. <laughs> Look at you! <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a lovely fringe. You know. <laughs> and so did your horse and your counsellors. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what you don't see anymore, and that's wrestlers posing for photos uh, for magazines in the ring. So it's because we have banned the photographers from around the ring. Yep. Why? So they control what pictures get out yeah the 28 year old Canadian is taking on 26 year old Rob Van Dam fuck yeah RVD's gimmick is that he's way too talented to stay in ECW and it's openly entertaining offers from the big leagues he's been working the dirt sheet saying that he's headed to WCW what a perfect antagonist for the ECW crowd yeah but haven't they done this before with Foley come and get me Mr. Bischoff and or Uncle Eric or whatever he's calling him. Do you remember he was doing these kind of promos because yeah, of the, the Kane Dewey thing? Very good, yeah. Yeah. Good so this guy. It's, it's, Foley it's, fan for life. Fucking really. I've read all his shitty books. That's the problem. No, in fairness, the first one's good. <laughs> Fuck the rest of them. Then. It's a stand-up, that shit. <laughs> it's a very, very good gimmick, but it's been done. I, I quite like his gimmick. Lance Storm's gimmick is obviously taking tickets for the Ferris wheel. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got for us? This match starts off with a tie-up, of course. A clean break by Lance, because, uh, as you know, he's the face. Another tie-up, and then a cheap shot by Rob Van Dam, because he's the heel. I think that's one of my biggest problems with Rob Van Dam. He, you know, he likes to show off. He gets a pop, so he comes off like a face, if- and then... All of a sudden, you'll see him do like a low blow, and it's like, "All oh, right, he's a fucking yeah. heel, shit." But if you have a like a spectacular move set, you're obviously gonna be face, whether yeah. you like it or not. Lance Storm hits a lovely clothesline. We get some lovely uh, uh, chain wrestling, followed by a nice crossbody and a suicide dive by Rob Van Dam. A very nice leg drop by Rob off the turnbuckle. He does it like Macho Man used to do his awesome elbow drop. Like, he doesn't jump, he just kind of walks off it and falls. RVD then hits the Van Terminator. Actually, which is the move when he does it to the corner? Is that the Van Terminator, or is the Van Terminator the corner to corner? Cor- coast to coast is the Van Terminator. Okay, so what's the one when he gets the chair and runs around and jumps and kicks it in the face? Van Sarah Connor. He hits the Van Sarah Connor and then hits a splash for a two. RVD misses his monkey flip and Landstorm hits a nice T-bone suplex onto the chair. However, RVD, master of psychology that he is, still jumps up to his feet first. Landstorm hits a slightly less girly cartwheel splash. It's not quite the same as the cartwheel elbow. Do you know what I hate about that? They never get it right, so they always do the cartwheel and then whatever the flip or whatever. And, they and then they like run a little, little shuffle backwards to do the elbow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lance timed this beautifully. Like he came up from his cartwheel at the right time and just mm. fucking splashed him. It was really cool looking. Then unfortunately, the only botch of the entire match, Lance fucks up his uh, single leg Boston Crab really badly and the fans let him know about it. Then <laughs> Lance Storm hits the two worst chair shots you'll ever see he gets booed incredibly loudly nice tiger bomb for a two absolutely gorgeous german suplex for a two woeful chair shot number two boo Followed by woeful chair shot number three. Boo! Boo! <laughs> Beta amyloid plaques, so, fuck you! <laughs> they're so bad. And then, then he goes for his fourth one, but Rob Van Dam hits a Van Daminator and a standing moonsault for the win. I absolutely love seeing Lance Storm with its <laughs> chair shot. They're so funny. You gotta resp- I, like, I don't like Lance Storm as a person. 
think he's a whiny bitch. Yeah. But you got to respect the fact he just didn't want to hurt a fellow wrestler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Supposedly he did want to do them, but Heyman said that he had to do them or something. Well, if he did them badly, he'll never be asked to do it again. Yeah. having a great match with me at the pay-per-view. But see, Rob Van Dam ain't like that. I ain't out here to get your respect. I ain't out here to get these people's respect. And I don't give a shit about getting respect from any of the boys back there in the ECW dressing room, including Paul E. You're right, I am an asshole. You see, I sold out to myself by putting my boots on and getting in the ring tonight. After obviously being chosen as a second line wrestler to fill in for somebody injured. Rob Van Dam is no second line anything. You see Lance Storm by beating you here, Rob Van Dam is worth more money here. And Rob Van Dam is now worth more money elsewhere. Really liked the post match promo. It's pretty much the first time I've ever seen Ori D have a character and a promo because for the entirety of his career in WWE and in TNA he's just cool yeah whatever you know a great checklist of impressively athletic moves although Lance is much sloppier than the incredible smoothness you'd expect from in WCW WWF mm-hmm. but uh, it's same with RVD they both uh, tighten their game <laughs> to a high standard over the next few years a great match I saw a match with these two lads and I think it was Guilty as Charged 99, which was so much better than this, but it was um, very entertaining. A couple of botches, so what? But overall, yep, really happy. Um, I have to say, I love RVD's kickboxing martial arts offense, but his moves and character haven't changed in the last 15 years. Still the same dude. Just slower. Yes, yeah, that's for his point. <laughs> in 97... Uh, he just has a much wider arsenal and is about four times faster than he is now. He's a lot beefier in 97 as well. He really slimmed down when he came in in 2001. Mm. Although already shows some cockiness, it's quite understated. It's like these wrestlers, himself and Lance Storm, are built by how they perform in the He's ring. He's far too busy doing his moves to care about his character. Like, yeah. The one thing I don't like about lack of psychology in matches is that, yeah, I know. You miss the build to the end. That there is none. Mm. You know, like the only thing, as we know, the only thing that matters in WWE matches is the last two minutes. They always do well to build up big matches at the end to a crescendo. There's no real crescendo in these matches. It's just move after move, and I love it. But then you're like, oh, we got the pin, and the crowd. It's almost an anticlimax when you get the victory. Mm. That's classic Randy Orton booking, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Mm. Throw to a Terry Funk promo accepting a Lifetime Achievement Award from Tommy Dreamer as Paul E voices over Funk's goal to be ECW champion. Joey Styles prefaces the next match featuring wrestlers from Michinoku Pro, a mix of Japanese wrestling and Lucha Libre. I actually really like this. He'll take a minute out and get over what he needs to. It's, it's I think it's very smart. I like it. And it breaks things up as well, you know? It feels kind of candid. And... It? you get more plot from Joey Styles <laughs> than from the booking. So, you know, it's kind of nice to have it in there because otherwise it would literally just be moves for two hours and 40 minutes. Next up, it's Michinoku Pro Wrestling International six-man tag complete with Jap Riff with Bowler Haircut. Nice. <laughs> Great Sasuke, or as Joey Styles would say, Sasuke. Oh, sorry, I didn't... Okay. That's what I thought you were going for. God, I'm not doing that now. I'm done with that. (laughs) (laughs) Gran Hamada, the owl lad in black, he's 45 years old, 
and Yakasiji Gran Naniwa was injured. Versus Men's Teo, aka Terry Boy, because he's a huge Terry Funk mark, Dick Togo and Taka Michinoku, i.e. two thirds of WWF's Kayentai, no show Funaki. Hey! Jumpy Jumpy your beep Dressed in BWO tees, they're the International Blue World Order. And I assume that that would denote them as faces, because they got a big pop for it, but they're supposed to be heels. And that's seen with that awesome three man photo op pose spot that they did. And in Michinoku Pro, they'd have five members and do it with five people. Oh. Styles thanks wrestling reporters Dave Meltzer and Mike Johnson for their notes on these lads. That was very nice of them. Oh man. Oh, they got the fucking Japanese coloured streamers. I was like, yes. I miss that from wrestling. It's so awesome. Yeah. I wish Daniel Bryan took it with him to the WWF. The Owlad Grand Hamada and Taka kickoff. Masato Yakasiji is the holy fuck Christmas elf in green. <laughs> They chant Power Ranger at him, but it's like, holy shit. He looks like, do you remember Kane uh, when he was the Christmas creature? Was that USWA probably? I've only seen seen a picture of it. It's like, holy shit. But it's not Christmas. It's April. (laughs) No excuse. Steve! (laughs) What bar is the Christmas Power Ranger? (laughs) Well, Jay, for this lovely little green getup, I've gone old school. I've gone Fat Frog. Love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> easy, an easy one. Yeah. Easy one. But classic. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> he also could be a Tangle Twister because yeah. it was white in there yeah. as well. You've done him. You've done Tangle Twister. <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. Have done I it. really? <laughs> it looks like there's actually tag rules in this match. People are tagging in and out. Maybe because it's a Japanese referee. I, I think this was done under... Mishinoku Pro rules. I just took it for granted because they were tagging and the Japanese ref look. I was very, very impressed with uh, Hamada and how well he moved for an owl fella. I thought he looked very, very impressive. Sasu- Sasuke is... Sasuke. Sasuke. No, Sasuke. Sasuke. Yeah. Is that actually what yeah. it is? Oh, uh, Styles pronounces it wrong. He ah. says Sasuke. But it's Sasuke. Sasuke. Yeah, trust me on it. I asked nerds from the internet. Dead now. Okay. So, Sasuke... <laughs> Sasuke is extru- extremely over. The fans know him well. He gets a great pop when he finally tags in. The opening couple of uh, minutes of this match are basically filled with lots of quick tags and flips and the BWO were selling like bosses uh, for Sasuke. So, Togo tags in and just baits the shite out of everybody and eventually Yakashigi comes in and hold on I'm completely lost here that's a, I this match is Don't going to try to call this entire match I, I, that's a, I'm trying to selectively uh, pick stuff uh, Mr. Plow that's my name that name again is Mr. Plow with the BWO uh uh, with lots of quick tags. Don't just um, call them Kaintai. Because we have the BWO showing up later, so it's just a bit weird. How about we call them the Bo? The Bo <laughs> <laughs> make lots of quick tags, and uh, Terry Boy hits a lovely uh, delayed vertical suplex on Dick Togo. Hamada and Terry Boy go one on one. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, I just, this, this match just literally has like a brand, like a tag in on every line. It's like every line is two different people doing moves on each other. Um, Yakasiji hits a baseball slide into a head scissors to the outside. An awesome single leg Boston Crab by Sasuke. Take that, Landstorm, you big cunt. <laughs> uh, whoa, work over Sasuke and do their awesome uh, pose, which I personally thought was the best part of the match. I thought it was fucking awesome. The match peaked, and it probably should have ended because the fans are a bit fucking flat now. Terry Boy tries to figure four on Sasuke as the fans woo like mental. 
Sasuke reverses a hip toss into a DDT, which was probably my spot of the match. It was absolutely awesome. I have shield here, bollocks. <laughs> I have shield here. <laughs> <laughs> the BWO hit an extremely safe looking uh, broke back power bomb, as I call it. <laughs> it's nothing to do with broke back mountain. It's because uh, poor old Roman Reigns is back is sore, so he needs Dean and Thing to. T- is that why? T- oh, yeah, yeah. I've no he's idea. Joking. Oh, he's joking. <laughs> right. okay. It's I I I think it's a terrible move. Uh, it's a really it don't bad make no sense. Triple spot. Well, they're yeah. adding force by pushing. But it looks down. less yeah, painful. It does. Yakusiji bumped like a fucking boss for everyone. Sasuke botched number one. He goes for the running power bomb into the you know like when you run at someone and flip and they t- turn into a power bomb except he falls on his arse and looks like a big Egypt and uh, like a big indie geek just gets up and does it straight right again were you surprised the crowd did not chant you fucked up they should have they were very very nice to Sasuke then they actually pull off the counter and he turns it into like a oh a f- hurricane rada <laughs> and <laughs> nearly it, necks himself yeah it's like, Forget it's it. just absolutely terrifying watching this this guy wrestle like so bocce 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 so we get a lovely uh, super atomic drop by Terry Boy from the top rope and a big splash to the outside by Taka Michinoku followed by a drop kick by Yakasiji good stuff the match turns into a bit of a schmaz an absolutely amazing power slam by Dick Togo Sasuke finally gets the win and ends with a tiger suplex for the three Excellent. 16.55 this went. It's like, holy shit. This is an unbelievable high work rate match. They just go and go oh, and I've go. I've seen better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like, unlike RVD and Storm, who weren't that smooth working together, like these lads look extremely comfortable in the ring together, moving seamlessly from spot to spot and wrestler to wrestler. I just, just so many devastating high spots that you don't believe moves like... Even like a top rope drop kick or a leaping swinging DDT or power bomb could end the match. So mm. that's just a bit weird. Yeah, it was it was about twice as long as it should have been. The crowd died basically halfway through, and it, it, they really could have ended on a high note and people would have been happy. But it's just kind of anti climax at the end. I really thoroughly fucking enjoyed it. Um, but again, I my interest started to wane after a while. Too many spot fests. Yeah, it was, like it was, it was. Yeah, I, I hold my hands up completely. Um, mm-hmm. People, you know, may say, oh, if you like this, you'll love, you know, I don't know, New Japan or Davey Old Japan or whoever. Dragon or, Gate. Or, or, or whatever. Yeah. But this is, for me, is a treat, and I don't want to get used to this stuff. I don't want to be... If you make this your normal, not only does it ruin everything else, yeah. it kind of spoils this exactly. being your nice treat as well. You exactly. Know? Once in a while, this is really, really great. The crowd in this, this one match that they pissed me off when... There was one particular move they that it was botched, but not that botched, and they started chanting "You fucked up." One out of a thousand moves is botched, and they're fucking, you know, giving it shit. I they didn't like that. They also probably don't understand what they're chanting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean the the Jap stuff? Yeah. Is that right? Like, oh, you're very good. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, but I, what I did like was when the crowd. If there is a, an anticipation of a really big spot, everyone just went quiet. And, and I quite like And if they did more of that anticipation, I think it would really pay off. Hmm. So, thanks to this match, Taka and his actual mentor, Sasuke, would get a pay per view payday wrestling a singles match at WWF's legendary Canadian Stampede three months later. Uh, yeah, really could have used an intermission after this match. Holy shit. Uh, so, whatever the next match is, it's the death spot. <laughs> 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 Match number four is Shane Douglas versus Anthony Durant, aka Pitbull number two, aka the match that time forgot. Franchise comes out with his protection, not condom, the Riot Squad, and Francine, who's looking great as the head cheerleader and in some kind of boudoir hussy. I've written here that 
Francine isn't very pretty, but she has a whopper arse. And she's slutty. She's dirty looking, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I like that. Valet Francine debuted in mid-95, and Heyman's main aim was to get her to... Uh, Steve, can you pronounce that for me? Godfight! <laughs> <laughs> with Beulah McGillicuddy. Initially paired with Stevie Richards, she switched to the Pitbulls after they left Raven's Nest, calling herself the Beast Master. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a few videos like that. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> she turned heel at Heatwave 96 to join Franchise and help kayfabe injure Pitbull number one's neck. And that sets up this match against Pitbull number two. Number one and number two. You fucking jobbers. <laughs> you don't even Especially have this bloke. He's two. Because he's two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it should be Pitbull one and Pitbull A. <laughs> How about 1A and 1B? No, that's still no, a, a hierarchy there. Yeah. You're a football it's like player. You're a classroom. Like. <laughs> the franchise, in his third successive OSW review, good for you, not for us. <laughs> According to Douglas, Vince promised him riches but gave him a chalkboard. The actual former high school teacher had a fucking awful time in WWF, debuting in late August 95 but was back wrestling in ECW in under eight months. And here we are a year later and he's still banging on about it. He starts shooting. You're looking at the first man to call pussies out from another organization and they ain't man enough to come. I'm the first guy who called out pussies from other organizations and they're not man enough to come. Fuck off. Like, he hated WCW because Flair held him down. He hated WWF because Vince held him down. The click held him down. But you not see the pattern here of never making it to the top anywhere. You know WCW. what I mean? WCW. He was their champion for, like, the first month, and then... No, he was champion then in the late 90s as well. Was he? Yeah. When everyone left, like... Taz was still Exactly. There. If... You don't make it, and you're saying the gimmicks don't work. Well, you know, riddle me this. It's 2006. Vince says, you're going to have a handler. Get some face paint on you. You are a savage that can't spock. Spock. (laughs) (laughs) I can't spock. spock. That's your gimmick. (laughs) So you're Jay Hunter, basically. It's like have a feud with him and Vader. It'd be awesome. (laughs) What I'm saying is Umaga made his gimmick work really well and because he's so talented. That's right, and Joe turned that down, right? Mm. Smell Joe. But he had the gimmick anyway in TNA. <laughs> <laughs> the big dick on his face. <laughs> he has take penis, yeah. <laughs> and could he not just be something like um, Damien Sander? Mm. No? Like a genius thing yeah. or something. Yeah. No, I'm going to shoot. I'm going to shoot. I'm blame everyone else. That's what I'm saying. So it's a lot won, of complaining. He won the IC title, and back in the 90s, that wasn't the easiest thing to do. So, you know. Stop giving him credit, Steve. <laughs> 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 so Pitbull number one is Gary Wolf, who's sitting at ringside with a broken neck. He had injured his neck, and it healed by the time they started uh, doing it, making an angle out of it, where they'd pull his halo. Is it the documentary by Borash that goes into... This Forever hardcore, angle, yeah. Yeah. and they try to fob it off as if it's all real. I'm like, fuck off, Borash. Like, we've done nothing but praise that man. Yes. But this documentary came out in the 2000s, and he's trying to fob it off like it's real. But, like, he, your man would rip off his neck brace, and he'd have a schmoz. Like, it's. And he'd wrestle before this pay per view and after this pay per view. No one believes. Are you serious? Yeah. I did not know that. It's it's obviously bollocks. Like, but uh, yeah. How about that? In the ring versus Shane Douglas is Pitbull number two, aka Anthony Durant. I fucking love the psychology here. I'm so mad at you. You broke my tag partner's neck. Let's have a straight wrestling match. Yeah. <laughs> Farty pyro <laughs> with the poverty pup. <laughs> uh, I have a section. It means V one called the match. Nice, right? Right off, both guys get into a back and forth brawl. Lots of punches and clotheslines. Pitbull two grabs Shane's neck and tries to wrench it and break it 
And that is basically the story of this entire match. And uh, I have it here. Ha! <laughs> A story! Deadly! <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. So, while he's doing this, the awesome fans chant, Break his neck. Which is great, because that only adds to the entire match. <laughs> Within the space of a line, I have gone from saying, yeah, this is great, and it's uh, adding to the match, to giving out about rest holds. <laughs> so, uh, Douglas hits a pile driver, uh, which I thought was the best move of the match by fucking Miles. It's a... Uh, oh, yeah, did you notice, though, he keeps doing these delayed pile drivers? You know the way, like, a delayed... Vertical suplex looks awesome. Yeah. A delayed pile driver kind of just looks like some weird sexual position <laughs> where, you know, you're kind of one guy's kissing the other guy's bum and giving him a reach around at the same time. <laughs> Only if you turn the lights out, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas goes for a second pile driver as the fans boo him like crazy for trying to break his neck. And then he goes for a third one and then hits a nice looking snap mare. Uh, Douglas then puts on the camel clutch in front of Pipple 1. I thought this was going to be a great spot, but no. He just... Your man forgets to fucking sell. He doesn't do anything. He's just looking around saying, how's it going? Not, a, not enough left. How are you, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's me. <laughs> How are you, Anto? <laughs> this spot got no fucking heat. Which proves that both guys had lost the fans, and the fans have basically given up. Like, so Pitbull one attacks Shane Douglas, but is stopped by the security lads. Pitbull Gary is uh, taken backstage. That's it. Pitbull throws a barrier into the ring, and fans chant, "We want blood." Douglas tries to pick up Pitbull, and like put him down on the barrier on his balls but whatever way he does it he bangs his fucking knee off it and the barrier falls I would have been fucking furious if this bell end had done that Just what a terrible wrestler <laughs> Pitbull catches Douglas when he tries to move from the top rope but Douglas kicks him and they both fall down we have a dub spot <laughs> with both men so then both men get up and we have another dub spot <laughs> it's straight after when they hit a double clothesline. I kind of marked out to that, I'm not going to lie. Francine hands Douglas something. Turns out that it's a brass knucks. So Francine sneakily hands Douglas some brass knucks. Why sneak? Why sneak? Yes, yeah. you have no need to sneak. Yes, yes. Uh, Douglas hits two punches, then breaks a piece of table over Pipple's head for a two-shot. Hits him with a chair shot to the head for another two. Uses the ring bell for another two. More table shots. More bell shots for more two counts. Then Pitbull takes Douglas's chain. Takes out Shane Douglas. Takes out Chris Candido who was run down for interference. But somehow gets rolled up for a fucking two count. Because Douglas no sells his own fucking chain shot. Are you fucking He's kidding me? He's impervious to chain. He is a terrible wrestler. <laughs> then we get a nice belly-to-belly -belly slam for the win to end this match. What did you think? Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was a bit bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, it, was, it was the classic kind of um, everyone take a rest after the big spot match and they really took it to heart. You know, the referee is starting to kind of say he counts to five and they're still on the ropes. He's just kind of giving out to them. He is, he's perilous, completely perilous. Mm. But, uh, you know, he's like, oh, come on, break it up, guys. Come on, I'll be your best friend. And just, nah, fuck off. It just makes no sense to have a referee in there in the first place. You know, do you remember like old or even like current uh, wrestling games that you just, when you count to three, you just hear it's over the intercom. You like can have dub. something like that. Do you ever play WWF Raw on the Sega Mega Drive? You know, it's the intercom. One, two, three, you know. One, two, three. Just mm. have that. I just wanted to get it in there because I'd like you to splice in a little bit. Unless <laughs> WWE Network would get upset. Because <laughs> okay. it was like one of my great childhood uh, <laughs> okay. wrestling games. I'll see what I can do. And then if you're doing a chokehold on somebody, the strangest sex noises in the world. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> it, was fucking, it was fucked up, man. That sounds awesome. <laughs> It's 
fucked up. <laughs> At this point, Douglas is saying he's the franchise. Can you do your Crichton, you're lying impression? <laughs> That's the reference you're getting. That's the right? reference. So basically, Douglas says... You're lying! Wait, <laughs> do we? I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Two take, Jay. So, it's a shitty match. Douglas is saying he's a franchise. I don't think he can say that. I think... <laughs> That's my piece. beautiful. Post match, some mass man says over the PA. Sorry, the tannoy system. The tannoy, yeah. Yeah. That he'll unmask in exchange for Francine. Hilarious. How'd you know he was masked if you could only hear his voice? <laughs> Maybe it was. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Hilariously, Styles points out the mass man is Rick Rude. As we see, whoever it is is wearing a simply ravishing robe. It's a trap. Rude was the security card all along. The masked man is revealed to be Bulldozer Brian Lee. Chains. Who is also? The Underfaker. Awesome. From SummerSlam 94, we're not reviewing it. I'd love to do that. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and hits his prime time slam, which is a choke slam, on the franchise. As himself and Rude celebrate in the ring, which is by far the biggest pop in this bout. Yep. This match went a grinding 20 minutes 43 wow. seconds wow after the previous three matches the pace of the pay-per-view slowed to a crawl like the normally raucous vociferous ECW crowd they're sitting on their hands for this match these men desperately needed to have their shortcomings masked by garbage wrestling I, I oh <laughs> Fucking wants to smash Douglas. Immediately no sells a metal chain shot to go for a near fall. Yeah. I flipped out when but, he just bounced up. But what's even worse is that that's his move. So he's no selling something that's gonna hurt himself in the future. <sighs> Steve, he's impervious to chain. <laughs> There's a bit where Franchise slowly batters Pitbull too, getting the lion's share of the offense, but Pitbull kicks out. No crowd reaction. I think, like, when Pitbull and Douglas laid the match out, they'd be thinking, oh, all these near falls, it'll it'll be a big emotional affair. Pitbull won't go down. I'm with Gary there and all. It's a roller coaster of emotion. Yeah. You know? But, oh, he just received, there's like a smattering of booze and boring chants. Uh, mostly apathy, though. <sighs> Fans don't give a shit. They just start chanting stuff with Francine. The, you know... The, the You're a crack whore. She's got Get herpes, your tits yeah. out. She's got herpes, yeah. 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 yeah, overall, slow, boring, garbage. And not in the Hall of Fame kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> Raven cuts a promo backstage. Literally backstage. It's on some wooden steps that lead to nowhere. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> this is your master bedroom. <laughs> I didn't have this now. Oh, really? Oh, fucking whoop de doo <laughs> Cut to Raven cutting a promo backstage on some wooden steps. Given his overly verbose, darkly pretentious promo, he says 90% of the people came to cheer the bitter shell of the has-been that is Terry Funk, but 10% came to rage against the machine, who will scream against the corporate sold out powers that be, and raise the arms in a crucifix that they're martyrs for a dysfunction- Oh, fuck off, stop talking. I stopped listening to you very exactly. quickly. Exactly. And that was, what, six seconds? Uh, I, was I, I heard Martyr, and that's mm. about it. And Steps. <laughs> <laughs> the best part was someone walked by and he cast a large shadow over Raven, and he was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I loved Raven in the WWE. I thought his character was awesome, and he didn't get anywhere near what he should have. But, oh, fuck off. If it was this, what he wanted to do. But his gimmick is fucking awesome. No question about yeah. it. Yeah, agreed. The, the, this promo sounds like the the current Bully Ray character. Have you heard his promos? He's cutting promos in churches and all. And he's like, now was the winter of my discontent. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. You're a fucking bully biker. And now you're... Harbinger of Doom. Is this like? new, is it? Yeah, he's been doing it a couple of weeks. It's horrific. Now, in the dust of hell lurk the blackest of hates, for he who is fear awaits you. Ken Anderson, 
You have raped me of my future. Now, what, what was um, Ken Anderson saying during this? What, something about a match that he wanted to have? Where's my rematch? <laughs> you guys screwed me out of the title shot. <laughs> Which way is it going to be, Mr. Anderson? You guys screwed me out of the title in the first place. Where's my rematch? <laughs> so, something along those lines? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And with that, <laughs> we bring you to the ad break questionnaire. Asshole, asshole, asshole. It's time for the ad break questionnaire. This week's question What bar are the Dudley Boys? What are they wearing, Steve? The Dudley Boys are both wearing. Dark blue dungarees. Devon is wearing like a greeny tie dye shirt. Bubba Ray is wearing like a purpley reddish tie dye shirt. Come on, you guys, it's only a little. Giant! A hungry giant! Hungry for a big honey taste. So the question for the Abbey Questionarium is what bar are the Dudley Boys? The answer is... A mint crisp and a tiffin bar. Nice. Both the Cadbury's ones. Oh, very yeah, good. Very mm. good. Tonight is about Stevie Richards shedding that image and becoming a man. Cut to a Stevie Richards vignette. Odd, oh, uh, well, you're a main eventer? Aren't you a comedy gimmick? A parody gimmick of some lads in the WCW. In black and white, Stevie cuts a serious promo, hair over face. He says tonight he'll step in the ring, not as big Stevie Cool, but as Stevie Richards, just that Stephen made, looking for respect and the video itself turns to colour. The blue meanie imitates Razor. The promo is your standard stern baby face, but I thought this completely jars with his parody BWO shtick and his comedy theme underneath. Horrific. He is terrible at speaking his lines. <laughs> like Jay was saying, he put his hair over his face and he looked down and he was trying to be all brooding and shit. And I was like... Get the boat, mate. Was he wearing the blue t-shirt? Yes. Can't take him seriously. It, it, it was in black and his little fucking Daisy yeah. Dukes. <laughs> <laughs> and the, you know, the comedy song underneath as well. Yeah. The so it's just It didn't work. It didn't work at all. This is his peak, actually. Actually, no, his peak is winning the main event of WrestleMania 20. You know, so was, you know. <laughs> oh, am I missing something here? The oh, there we go. <laughs> Survive if I let you. Sabu, the time for talking is done. I have waited my whole life for a match like this, for an opponent like you. I hate you, Sabu, and you hate me. Next up, it's Taz versus Sabu. Cut to a classic ECW make the most out of what you can pre-taped interview. It's a close-up shot, black background via a curtain, just Taz with a tatty black towel on his head. Looks awesome. Menacing, no cost. It, it was a bad promo though. It was a terrible promo. Yeah. He says, I'll bust you up, Sabu. You know it, Sabu. I'm going to beat you up, Sabu. You know it, Sabu. That's basically it. He says he wants this match with Sabu badly, 
and will bring him hell and he loves it. I can assure you he didn't say he wants it badly. He said he wants it bad. Because <laughs> he's <laughs> grammatically <laughs> stupid. <laughs> uh, Bill Alfonso, in his hilariously nerdy voice, runs down wrestlers Taz choked out, which Taz promises will happen to Sapu. Two of the biggest names in ECW, synonymous with the company, square off. Sabu was the poster child of Heyman's vision of ECW, an embodiment of a completely different type of wrestler. Trained by his uncle, the Sheik Ed Farhat. Farhat? F-A-R-H-A-T? Farhat? Farhat. Farhat. The Sheik Ed... (laughs) Ed (laughs) Farhat? Trained by his uncle, the Sheik Ed... You can only see those letters. Yes. <laughs> uh, Kenny Dykstra with the ferret. Yeah, like, yeah. Stumping, can... a, stumping a ferret making a coat. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Trained by his uncle, the Sheik Ed... F- fuck. Trained by his uncle, the Sheik Ed Ferret. <laughs> <laughs> this has to be your intro to the show. <laughs> Just bleep. Bleep. <laughs> Trained by his uncle, he initially was billed as Sabu the Elephant Boy from Saudi Arabia. He's actually a second-gen Lebanese from Detroit, who was lauded for his barbed wire death matches from FMW, uh, Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling in Japan. Brought in by Todd Gordon, his Arabian ring attire and scarred body instantly made him stand out. He arrived to the ring, contorting like a crazed madman strapped to a gurney, fighting his restraints with a Hannibal Lecter's type mask and was only released from his bonds in order to wrestle it looks fucking awesome but he said he was knackered before his match started Uh, his weapon of choice was the wooden table now Taz he started in ECW in 93 as one half of the Taz Maniacs with Joe Chetty literally like the cartoon Taz have you seen it when the fucking Flintstones get up shit jumping up and down like uh Name name of like a little Tasmanian devil. Yeah. Yeah. He should he should have just gotten like a cloak a and started, <laughs> started spinning like <laughs> fucking hell, mate. <laughs> he held the tag titles with Sabu before he bolted for New Japan, and that's when Heyman played it off like Sabu sold out, despite having previously blown off a better deal in New Japan to, to do ECW dates. In '95, the Tasmaniac broke his neck when he didn't tuck his chin in taking a double pile driver from Two Cold Scorpio and Malenko. And much like Stone Cold, it was a neck injury that put his career on wind down. He returned to the ring late that year with a completely retooled character, a badass, no-nonsense, submission-styled shoot fighter. The human suplex machine used a variety of Taz plexes and his Yuji Katami submission hold, the Taz mission, bringing tapping out to American wrestling prior. It was just a verbal submission. Sabu! I'm gonna choke you out! See you on the 13th! Despite being on different paths, Sabu feuded and was now tagging with RVD. Since Taz's return, a big time match between the two was always on the cards. Heel Taz had been insulting, goading and calling out Sabu for over a year and made a promise at November to Remember 96 and makes good on it tonight. What do you think of these lads? Uh, first of all, I think Taz looks awesome. The towel gimmick uh, looks cool. It was uh, much, much cooler than when uh, Kane did it. <laughs> 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 what were they thinking? He's also in great shape. Like It's so weird going back watching this now when you look at what Taz has turned into in the last you know 10 years or so. His legs are fucking huge. It's ridiculous. He's got a good character. And he's got the booking to, like, back it up. So, you know, if he says, oh, I'm going to tap out people, he's generally booked to fucking tap out people. So, yeah. Sabu, no. I think he's terrible. I think he's dangerous, which I think that's the worst way for a wrestler to be. I think his character's a mess. It's all over the place. Don't have much love for him at all. Yeah, yeah, as you say, a bit of a mess. Like, we talk about bad ring attire. This guy must be up there, like... Looks like a knacker, like a dirty knacker, <laughs> doesn't he? And you know the way you don't like greasy long hair? It's, yeah. It's constantly greasy. It's disgusting. Isn't it? <laughs> I don't think he, he looks, well, very unique. You know, there's no one else that looks like him. Yeah, but he looks indie. 
I, I think it's a cool look. Do you? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think everyone should have parachute pants, but, you know, just just, just him, you know? Okay, all right. Steve! What bar is Carney Sabu? Sabu is a fry spearmint cream, or a Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gums, the green and white. Very good, very good. The announcer builds the contest as one of the main events tonight and introduces the combatants. We didn't get any of that build up I just mentioned earlier. Just, you know, that was me. But you could feel it was a big time affair. Badass Taz enters with his own security, much like Goldberg, called Team Taz with Bill Alfonso. It's weird, Sabu oddly forgoes his entrance and he hoofs it in the ring as soon as Taz is in. Yeah. Straight off the bat, Sabu sells a slap from Taz like he just got concussed or like burst an eardrum. Because he, he smashed him real good, and he had to go out of the ring and take a breather. I was like, are you actually hurt? He probably did smash him across the ear. Niall did it to me. I was hearing like, <laughs> for a fucking weekend. That was your hard drive spinning. Ah! <laughs> We're spinning. Right away, Sabu blocks the Taz mission. That's never been done the sort. Maybe he should have saved that spot. For the first time ever! <sighs> Tons of time wasting, no selling submission spots, regroup on the outside, jaw jack with the crowd. It makes it seem like they're buying time for Sabu, who got hit for six. Like, I, I, I can't think that Sabu has just great psychology. It looks like he got concussed and they worked around it for the match and he was able to shake it. But he never got um, his second wins. About it. it seems like... They just dealt with the problems as they got it. So it wasn't all it could have been. Mm. I think that actually says more about Taz being able to take someone who's being knocked a bit loopy and actually work a match around it. Because like you said, I don't think Sabu was, you know, like knew what he was doing. And even if he didn't know what he was doing, I don't think he's good enough to actually do it without being dragged to it. So yeah, uh, big thumbs up to Taz in this match. Sabu was able to shake the cobwebs long enough to do a couple of high spots correctly, though. I, I, just meant, I was looking at this, and you know the way you're saying oh, how hardcore the fans are and how passionate they are? There's about 3% of you wearing ECW t-shirts. And the rest of them have their arms folded and their backs turned. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even watch this much. Yeah, it, if you're so passionate, why aren't you supporting the product? Or Can you be anti-establishment while supporting a business? <laughs> A business that loses money. <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, You're so anti-establishment that you, you won't support yes. the anti-establishment. Exactly. Is why would you come to our event just to boo us? <laughs> 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 My favourite spot of the entire match actually was where Taz gives him his leg and says, go on, you can go for the takedown. And a second he grabs his legs, he's just like fucking sprawl, bam. Get your back fucking slap the shit out of you. Like, I really, really liked that. I was really impressed with Taz's range of submissions. It was it's very also, impressive. The only problem was I had, and it's probably from watching MMA, is that he doesn't work for them at all. He just slaps them on straight away. I'd love to see him go to the ground and have to fight and put them yeah. in. Yeah. However, though, the, like that, that, it kind of fits the character of. Sabu that he wouldn't know how to block these moves and like I don't buy that the homicidal suicidal maniac went to wrestling school to learn how to back out of an arm ringer you know what I mean I just I don't buy it at all he should like, you know he should bite his way out or something you know or scratch your eyes out <laughs> is it homicidal suicidal genocidal, genocidal. dance recital <laughs> <laughs> Sabu got a couple of host spots in, but never got out of the starting block. The, f the lead to the finish saw Taz focus on the neck, softening it up for the Taz mission. Sabu goes through a table on the outside and lands on his neck. There's a great touch where Alfonso encourages Taz to get back on Sabu, saying that he's not finished. He's, he's Sabu. Fucking stay on him. There was a nasty head and arm Tazplex and looks to a broken Sabu's neck. It was nasty. Mm. A headlock and belly to back Tazplex, a T bone suplex, and finally the Kaza Hajime half Nelson judo choke, aka Taz Mission. And Taz gets the clean tap out victory at 1749. I don't see how he could possibly fight off the Taz Mission. The Kaza Hajime choked out Bam Bam Bigelow. 9 1 1. Paul Marlich, Chris Jericho. Two over. It is over. 
you know, the, like Sabu botches a lot, and, and that's kind of par for the course for him. And he botched a few times in this match, but well, well, it it you know, and the crowd loving their you fucked up chance for Sabu, he'll get it right about fifty percent of the time, and when he does, it looks awesome. So give him a fucking break. He's trying. At least he's trying. He also did some pretty awesome stuff, jumping into the crowd. You know that kind of stuff that you know you just don't see nowadays. It was a very good match, but I expected a lot more from the two of them. I don't know why. Perhaps because neither of them really gave the indication that it was a grudge match. Yeah, like they were doing some crazy shit, but they didn't seem like they hated each other. Yeah, like there was no brawling. Yeah, there was no. I'm gonna kick you in the head exactly. t- ten times. You know, it's just I'm gonna do a move on you yeah. and you're going to botch your move on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, and it didn't get long enough. I think I would have gotten into the match more if it was another maybe another five minutes plus. The franchise got 20 minutes. What's these lads get? Uh, yeah, 17, 49. Really? It just didn't seem that long. Maybe that's because I enjoyed because the match. the match was actually yeah. good, yeah. yeah. Overall, I quite enjoyed this match. I really liked Taz. Despite some some moves like the head and arm Tazplex when he drops him right on his fucking head being disgusting I thought overall it was still pretty fucking cool like um, you know Sabu's triple chair jump thing six times botched three mm. so you're spot on 50-50 <laughs> um, yeah you know he, he does do some cool things uh, he, do, he does a Hurricane Rana, which I hear was his best move of the match by a mile, and then he followed it up with like a nice uh, leg drop, which Taz no sold and got back up, did his fucking arms pose and hit a nasty fucking head and arm choke. I think I'd definitely have to say this is the best match of the night so far by a mile. Recommend it. Good stuff. What I noticed is that I love how Joey Styles calls the actions here. I was like, I learned things listening to him. Like, he called the moves, and it was just... When's the last time you've learned anything in WWE listening there? Well, I don't know. I I don't even know how to download the app. Is there an app? What app? (laughs) Oh, you actually don't watch it all. Sabu pops up to his feet seconds later after the bell... No selling said onslaught. Oh, fuck right off. Like, what's the point of doing these neck breaking killer moves if you're gonna no sell it? Yeah. Post match, Taz upholds the code of honor, puts over Sabu in a show of respect. Sabu returns in kind, and the combatants hug in the ring. A face turn for Taz. And this gets uh, booze from the crowd. <laughs> uh, RVD comes out, who Pearl Harbors Taz and shit talks his tag partner, Sabu. But both start beating on Taz. Sabu botches. Uh, how long? <laughs> <laughs> the first scale the ropes attempt, but botches well enough to get on top and kind of fall through the table outside. The heels celebrate after Tabu. Tabu? <laughs> <laughs> He'll celebrate after Sabu gives Taz a taste of the Taz mission. Bit of that. With Taz incapacitated, Fonzie gets in the ring. Oh, you love this, Steve, don't you? He takes off his orange Taz tee to reveal a team Taz tee. And takes that off to reveal a Sabu tee. A picture of the wrestler on the front. Lovely. We're posing. (laughs) Big muscly man. (laughs) He unintelligibly says something about money and RVD saves it. He's an awesome sellout character and he says he loves to work Mondays. I just think that's that great. great. Line. Yeah. By the way, your man um, Alfonso, I still can't understand his motivation for switching allegiances here. Cause you're it's nearly as bad as when payment changed from Brock to Big Show. Oh yeah. That, no- that was You've so gone stupid. from amazing to shit. Yeah. Your ex-boy won the match and then after you're gloating about the fact that you're now the the loser's manager. You're a loser! <laughs> Get your wrestler to lose the match and put all your money on Taz. Come on. Taz, I taught you everything I knew. I own you, Taz. I'm the winner here. You're the loser. You cost me a lot of money tonight. I had all my money on you. Still fighting. Millions and millions of Rob Van Dam fans, we're all winners here tonight. Because I know you love me, and even those who don't gotta fucking respect me. And now, everyone can respect my entire family. I don't believe it. And now that I'm a pay per view superstar, and you other wrestling promoters want me, Get a hold of my man, Fonzie.
reminds me, he knows my schedule and I love to work Mondays. Uh, so we get the double turn of Fonzie, he's now heel, and Taz is now face. Did you realise that happened? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Like, <laughs> neither Sabu nor Taz, almost like Storm and RVD. You know, where's yeah. where's your, your facial expressions? Where's your playing to the crowd? Where's, where's your psychology? Where's your fucking... Oh, <laughs> God, I'm not saying it. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the bang into the cool heel era so it's everyone's a badass are you face are you mm. uh, who, who knows I feel this would have had greater impact if two weeks prior WWF didn't just do the greatest heel double turn of all time WrestleMania 13 Austin and Brett um, never mind they're still number two they're above the lofty heights of Sid and Goldberg's double turn bollocks at WCW Mayhem 99 it's when Sid passed out after a cross arm breaker and a cobra clutch. Yes. Well, why would you pass out? Ah, oh, it's a devastating manoeuvre. <laughs> From a guy who's never done it before. <laughs> <laughs> or since. <laughs> uh, never, nay, bother. Taz and Dreamer will become the top faces of ECW, while Sabu and RVD would be one of the top heel acts. On the balcony, Styles introduces Tommy Dreamer with Beulah McGillicuddy, no relation to Michael. Crowd chant, show your tits. She doesn't. <laughs> uh, they're doing commentary. I was like, why aren't you wrestling, Tommy Dreamer? And the story is that Tommy gave up his spot in a three-way dance to his mentor slash friend, Terry Funk, but he was actually a bit injured. So. It, just, it just makes Funk look weak. Funk isn't good enough to get there by himself so he needs his mate to go he needs you the can... old pity party yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they mentioned the long standing feud with Dreamer and Raven where Dreamer never beat him so it's time for your main event Mean Gene play us in It's a double whammy. Stevie Richards versus The Sandman versus Terry Funk, the winner to face Raven for the ECW title immediately afterwards. Did you know that this was happening tonight as well? No. I thought it was, oh, see you next pay-per-view. Up until they said it, I thought it was just triple threat match. And did you know that it was elimination rules? No. Yeah, neither. I'm really glad that you made because, yeah, I... I started giving out in my notes, but I didn't know if I had the right to give out or not. <laughs> that's, that's what I did. I said, why are these lads letting each other get pinfalls? And then later on, I put in it, ah, it's elimination. Because uh, yeah. it just look, I, I, Yeah, actually, now I can't give out about Sandman. I had a paragraph about that. Yeah. Oh, I can give out about well, Sandman. Oh, good. <laughs> Stevie Richards and the BWO enter. They're, man, they're quite over. I was, I was actually quite impressed. <laughs> I know that they're meant to be pissed take of the NWO, but they're jobbers, right? Well, they're main eventers here, I, I guess. Th- that, that was meant... So so why are they in the main event? Are they heels or faces? They're faces. But the, B- but the Japanese B- BWO were heels, right? Yes. Okay. This is on the level of a Kayantai, like, chubby or pee-pee, you know? Like, fuck's sake. Main event. But well, thankfully, that's where we are, 1,200 pounds, so you <laughs> can do that. Enter Sandman. It's much more subdued affair, because, like, whenever I see Sandman intros, he's 
coming out from the crowd and drinking loads of beer and everyone's going crazy and singing along and they don't really know the words it's just an excuse to have a smoke (laughs) (laughs) that's all it is it's like you in our entrance you just wanted to have a smoke (laughs) that's it just so happened there was a camera on me at (laughs) the time and like his entrance is literally the entire song and more solo and all but he actually can't wrestle like he's he's not a wrestler. Oh, he's terrible. Oh, he's horrific. Like he can jump off things. He can't even really do that. I he jumped off the top rope at one point. Have you seen how he lands? Yeah, he it's not good. Can't bump. Mm. He like uh, he's just all on his knees, kind all of all on his feet and knees, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he, like he'll he he'll land and trip and fall into the barricade. <laughs> and he's fucking desperate, isn't he? He is really bad. The Sandman, I thought. His chugging of beer is really impressive. Like, because Austin's very much spilled a beer everywhere and drink 2%. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to waste a drop. <laughs> that t- it's cost money. <laughs> it's empty. <laughs> anyway, well impressive. Like, yeah. He'll drink all of it. No, I can tell not impressive. Sp- take the rest. The fucking carny forehead it's disgusting afterwards. And it's who, who enjoys that? Who, who marks out to that? Yeah. Funk enters to the least intimidating theme song of all time. It's a good tune, though. Uh, Desperado by the Eagles. Not disputing the, the song, but f- a use in a theme song. It's one step above. Why can't we be, be friends? friends? Why can't, can't we, we be friends? friends? With the uh, opponent on the back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it gets a lo- nice, respectful ovation. Yeah. yeah. The big question going into this was, Steve, I think you'll agree, will they do the most hated triple threat booking of throw one guy out of the ring and have a singles and switch around and they do yeah. well they keep it together for about five minutes mm. yes so uh, yeah yeah alright Sandman Sounds offers <laughs> <laughs> Sandman offers the Funker a beer uh, he turns it down so Sandman drinks his beer and spits it in Stevie's face and the fans pop I enjoyed that because Stevie Richards can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> the opening to this match is really cagey. You know, no one wants to wrestle and very time wastery intro. Lots of walking in circles and looking at each other. So Sandman goes and gets a ladder. Sandman throws the ladder at Funk, catches him right in the head. Great shot. Uh, and then he does a ladder suplex onto Stevie Richards, which looked like it sucked. Funk nearly dies when he attempts a moonsault onto Stevie Richards. He nearly necks himself. Terry Funk uh, puts the ladder on his head and does the Benny Hill spin. Catches Sandman with two nasty knocks to the head. The first one to the front and then to the back. Sandman gets big nasty, <laughs> big colour all over his fucking face. Then Funk obviously falls when he's dizzy and the fans pop for it. Uh, Richards makes a comeback and sets up the Stevie kick. Hits Sandman for a two. Then hits Funk for a two as well. That was the best thing he's done done all night anyway. (laughs) So then Sandman and Stevie Richards brawl to the outside. Where Sandman does his seesaw move. Where the, the ladder is planted on the top rope. And he jumps off and grabs it, but he fucking misses it, and the ladder goes flying into the crowd. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, I'm sure someone got a smack of it. Like, Eventually he comes back in, he hits Funk in the head with a trash can as he pins Stevie. Is this where he goes out to get the trash can? Yeah. It's it's amazing. You gotta go back, because when he, he, go, he gets the trash can, and then he hoofs it into the ring, and it smacks him perfectly on the head that's yeah. twice he's done it he's got, so he's got a great impressive. aim yeah really good aim himself and Funker do a double suplex followed by a double spike pile driver loads more double moves including uh, springboard leg drops onto the ladder uh, which was on top of Stevie Richards Sandman is fucked he is exhausted and the other two aren't that far off he goes for a second seesaw ladder thing and completely misses it. 
takes a fucking weird bump there. Uh, double power bomb and double pin by Stevie uh, uh, by Funk and Sandman. And Stevie Richards is finally eliminated. And I have it in brackets here. What the fuck? Where did this come from? I had no idea. Obviously the fans didn't either because they chant bullshit. Boat lads continue to brawl and Sandman gets his barbed wire out. But Funk takes it off him and whips the Sandman's back. But luckily he no sells it and gets up. <laughs> <laughs> and wraps himself in it completely and like body checks him a, a couple of times. I... That makes no sense. He would do far more damage to himself. He does his leg drop, but he's not willing to land mm. on his air, so he lands on his feet and then flops. Uh, Bumping like a boss, man. Bump. Go to Stevie and tell him what I said to get word to them. They need to go home in 30 seconds. They need to go home within 30 seconds. We need them out. So then Funk puts the can on Sandman's head. Stevie super kicks him and Funk barely lands his moonsault for the win. What did you think of that, Steve? Yeah, it was typical. That's what you kind of, what when you think of ECW, you think of that kind of trash, crazy shit, you know. It wasn't very good. It just wasn't exciting or interesting or there was nothing cool done with most of the, the weapon spots. So I wasn't particularly interested. Yeah, it was quite a poorly executed match. Like, I thought, well, first of all, it's weird that there's three faces in this match. And it's because the winner has to be a face to face heel Raven. Um, aside from Funk's, like, I'm too old to succeed against the odds, never say die storyline, which he does great. He's always great at it. The match was bollocks. Fucking state of it. Wasn't smooth. Just a bunch of stuff that happened. And fuck Sandman and his no psychology. And his, I don't care, he can pin it, nonchalant, I'll just walk off and do whatever. And, alright, it works for his character, that's his character. Never book him in any kind of position in the main event, then. Mm-hmm. That's, that's not the He's type of character that should be doing that. It's ridiculous, it makes no sense. Tie your own rope, tie your own rope, tie your own... Hey, come out and play. <laughs> <laughs> Offsprings come out and play hits, and Raven comes out immediately, oh, okay. and goes straight into the yeah, title no, match. No build up whatsoever. The world champion is coming out, and he's just there. Um, at this point, they were pressed for time, so this match, the triple threat, would have went early, and they told Raven to hoof it in the ring. Yeah, but uh, Douglas had to get his twenty minutes. <laughs> we needed every second. It was a roller coaster, a sizzling <laughs> roller coaster with some hot gypsies thrown in. <laughs> not, not to mention Jay that Funk would not have been able to go much longer. Come on, he was pretty fucked. Oh, he, was bottoms, he didn't yeah. go any longer. <laughs> I don't think he got off his his back for this entire match, did he? Yeah, it's because uh, Raven beats him down, and then they decide to have the old ref stoppage check on him in a hardcore Raven match for the first time tonight. <laughs> check if someone's all right. <sighs> Uh, Raven does do his awesome sit down in the at the corner of the ring. Um, it's so weird up. that something so little can be so fucking cool. Like that mm. is really cool. Mm. I love it. He looks so young. It's like the Raven I know the most is from TNA with uh, <laughs> Sans thyroid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's rough. The kings of wrestling. The kings of wrestling. <laughs> Poor lad. We have to review some TNA. <laughs> um, so, what happens in the main event? Raven goes, gets a chair, hits Funk a few times, uh, which, again, he no-sells. And Raven looks fucking pissed. So then the doctor comes in, do the blood check on Funk, blah, blah, blah. Good God, he's a fucking wreck. <laughs> uh, they gotta keep him separated. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Tommy Dreamer on commentary. How have we gone this long without mentioning him? He, well, he was inoffensive up until the main, the, the main main event. <laughs> he wasn't on screen until. The main event. <laughs> He's so bad, you know. With the, he uh, can't do nothing. <laughs> And he's like, oh, no, Funk needs to do this by himself. You know, just a white meat fucking baby face that's got nothing to say. But uh, then, but not only does he have nothing to say, uh, Joey asks him a question. He says, no, man, I just leave me alone. I just need to watch the match here. 30 seconds later, he starts butting in <laughs> with his little quips. 
you, I think you, the, what they're trying to get over is Quick he's Richards. <laughs> so concerned mm. for Terry Funk and his health that he he's speechless and he just wants to watch in horror. Speechless for thirty seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I shall show you my speechlessness via speech. <laughs> There's an absolutely disgusting shot of Terry Funk leaning over the chair that Raven is just hitting him with and blood is pissing out of his forehead all over the chair. It's like, it made me think of um, Vince and Taker at like Survivor Series and their Buried Alive match where Vince oh. fucking gigs himself and it's just <laughs> blood everywhere. Disgusting. It's the only first time we got this kind of nasty shot of the night. Like, it's very much ECW try to put on a cleaner pay per view, mm. kind of broaden mm. their appeal. Definitely. Raven just keeps battering Funk for absolutely ages. Then he goes, he sets up a table, drags Terry Funk out- outside, and lays him on it. Raven puts him through the table. Some chick messes up for one spot. Yeah, it was. Reggie Bennett. <laughs> yes, okay. Which is a girl's name. Can you take this? Because th- that's all I've written. I refuse to even yes. write her name. A lovely, unnecessary debut of Reggie Bennett and her horrendous sit-down parabotch. <laughs> yes. I actually think that's the biggest botch we have seen in our uh, tenure as OSW reviewers. I'd, I'd love you to do some kind of... Poor Big Dick Dudley. Hello, it's his first night out of jail. (laughs) (laughs) Is this a shoot? (laughs) Uh, No, okay, fair. okay. He starts having a frack out with Tommy Dreamer and jumps off the balcony. Oh, poor lad, he maybe hits one table. Uh, Great that these tables were placed underneath him. Fuck, he hits one of them and the rest of it just splats on the concrete. The choke slam on Big Dick Dudley by Tommy Dreamer. The likes of which we wouldn't see again till 2002 with Hogan and Taker. <laughs> <laughs> incredible. <laughs> they just should have put a chicken coop on there. I know, but... and a, a few mattresses <laughs> under that. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird, it's like they've lost a camera. Because, you know, there's only three cameras to begin with, but they stay with Raven in the ring, who's looking at where Tommy Dreamer is, and all the crowd are looking where Tommy Dreamer is, but it's off screen. Tommy Dreamer makes his way to the ring, and he brawls for a bit with Raven. Then Tommy hits a swinging DDT, and Funker pins Raven for a blown spot to close two (laughs) (laughs) accounts. The bell was rung. Ah, fucking hell. And then they immediately do a small package tree count. And Funker wins it. Why couldn't they just let it go? Yeah, we were given a about this in Slammer 2000. They really should just let yeah. it go. Oh, that's right, it was like the fucking artist or something, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So the hardcore legend celebrates his ECW championship in the crowd with his best buddy, Tommy Dreamer. Overcoming the odds and his age, a lovely Christmas time finish for Terry Funk and ECW. A quick plug for the next pay-per-view, August 17th. Do a better job pushing that, lads. And we're out. The second little match between Funk and Raven that was a big improvement. I was, I thought at least it built to some kind of ending. It was my second favorite match of the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was what? It was a five minutes. Yeah, but oh, it was just that. It told a story, and at the end, you it could got feel, someone over. Yeah, it got someone. I actually, over. got two people over. Got Tommy Dreamer yeah, over as well. Yeah, and it, you can feel actually they're doing something here. They're going somewhere with this yeah. at the end. When Dreamer gets involved, so I was happy enough. Yeah. Like, I'm very happy for Terry Funk, and that's, you know, it's quite a lovely moment, but I felt bad for Funker taking, doing moonsaults and taking these nasty bumps, 53 years old, you know, and, you know, he'd never do this stuff if the crowd weren't so demanding, Mm. you know. Obviously, enough, quite a rush match. Like, the first one, they had to go home early, and this one, it's just fucking get it done, because we've got one minute left of airtime. You know, Heyman will tell you, oh, we lost Paris straight afterwards, that's bollocks. Oh, really? They're just, they're running out of time, like... So, you know, if they would have WCW <laughs> where the the fans lose the main event and they yeah, have to air out the next Jesus. one on Nitro. Like. 
And that closes the pay-per-view. Let us take it to the aftermath. Oh, but right, man. Cheers, Steve, for running down the match. Man. Great job. Butter. Sorry about the six, man. <laughs> <laughs> So, what did you think of the pay-per-view overall? It's a mixed bag. There was a lot of terrible wrestlers, such as Sandman, Pitbull, 1 and 2. Oh, I suppose it's pretty harsh on 1 to say that. <laughs> but, but then again, though, he, Miles was shit. He, he only had one thing to do in the entire show, and that was give a reaction as he's trying to break your mate's neck in front of you. And he's like, no. The match quality ranged from... Douglas's match being utter bollocks to not a match at all, you know, which is the kind of main event angle and the first match wasn't a match at all to some pretty decent matches like the Taz, Sabu, the six-man tag. Uh, RVD, Lance Storm was not terrible, but it wasn't that good either. Yeah, I enjoyed watching the show. I couldn't call it a good show. I don't think I'd even recommend it, but I think it's one of those shows that you kind of should watch. You know, it's the first ECW pay-per-view, you know? I decided I'd just give my thoughts in kind of just positive, negative, and then overall. So I love the high work rate, although it is tiring, especially with the Michinoku Pro. Sabu and Taz come off as really big stars. I thought Joey Styles did a great job by himself. Like, I didn't notice it was missing a colour commentator. I wasn't annoyed as uh, at the cat fight <laughs> as you. I thought it's fine. I grow to just the, accept it. It was the fact that he pretty much opened the entire show by going that was elimination. <laughs> <laughs> um, passionate, appreciative crowd is always great. Or v- oh man, this is the best we've ever seen RVD. So I love seeing him. Didn't know he could cut a decent promo. Francine and Beauda, yeah, pretty hot. Thanks for showing up. And uh, I like the nice Christmas time. Everyone's happy finish with Terry Funk winning the belt. And I think that's how you should end your first pay-per-view outing. Don't bullshit the fans and force them into getting the next pay-per-view. Just give them a high. But they also get over Tommy Dreamer and Raven have a feud, so you have something for next time. So, you know, perfect. And almost everyone is over top to bottom. Everyone except Douglas and Pitbull, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's like attitude error stuff with that many people over on the roster. That's cool. So the negatives, obviously enough, the production is in the fucking toilet. But, you know, making do of it, that's the point of ECW. Mm. Perhaps too high a work rate. You know, the flurry of moves makes everything look normal and that kind of sucks. A big negative, the crowd were bollocks before the main event instead of peaking at your main event. Yeah, apart from Funk's Never Say Die in the main event, which wasn't, you know, great. Just a big bunch of moves that happen until the finish. Um, basing it on how much I enjoyed, I enjoyed more than I didn't. I thought the first three matches, as in the tag match, RVD, the six-man, um, I enjoyed all of them. Taz Sabu enjoyed that, enjoyed the ending. So there was, wasn't a whole lot that I didn't enjoy. My favourite match was the first match, the tag match. I fucking loved it. <sighs> thought uh, you were going to say uh, Shane Douglas. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I even have some sense occasionally. But I have to say, overall, this is the best pay-per-view I've watched for OSW Review. Mmm.
two months before Barely Legal, they got some shocking advertising. They made a deal with the WWF to invade Raw and promote their pay-per-view. Which is mental. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Vince didn't see them as competition. He saw ECW as a potential developmental ground. So if he works with them, he can, it would give him a boost signing their talent over WCW. And this would also get people talking and hopefully pop a rating. Like, if you remember, this is 97. As much as I bang on about it, they were in dire straits. The TV ratings and the pay-per-view buys were all way down. And 97 is the only year in WWF where they posted a loss. Mm-hmm. You know, so and it was so bad that USA Network were going to cancel the show in '98. You know, we're talking really how crazy bad. is that? Like, only posting a loss like yeah. once. It's like you and Nintendo, <laughs> yeah. which are like eighty years of straight profit. Like, yeah. So we'd seen small angles and smattering of the ECW chance at pay per views, but nothing on this level. <laughs> so with half of the WWF roster away touring Germany. Yeah, why not? So Jerry Lawler issued a challenge. ECW guys, why don't you show up on Raw? And they actually had three matches on Raw. They were in the Manhattan Center, so Raw hadn't been there in 93, since 93. But it's small enough that you had enough members in the crowd knew who ECW were. And so it makes them sound, oh shit, it's a renegade promotion, everyone's buying them. Mm. You know? And they had Heyman on commentary and he tried to get them over. And he'd have some nice banter with Vince and... Him and Lawler would be kind of loggerheads with it. But the matches themselves, it's weird because you see with this match, they just go as long as they need and put in as many moves as they can do. But the matches were all tightly scripted. And it's like your shtick is that you use hardcore, hard hitting weapons, but they'll only use WWF weapons. So you can only use the stairs and this chair twice. <laughs> you know? But they all look like a bunch of indie gimmicks, jobbers coming in <laughs> and haven't been ushered out of the ring mm-hmm. you know it was really mean by WWF because they'd they'd have a match like it's Taz versus Mikey Whipwreck and throw the job around but they just throw to a promo by Goldust or by Farouk and start plugging other shit on the USA Network so it wasn't you know it's not like you're going oh shit you're not mm. you're dismissing them it's like an obligation yeah. that you have to have them on there Oh, you get the spot where Sabu jumps off the oar of Raw and he kind of botches and falls on Team Taz, you know? But, you know, they all showed up anyway, but they're all jobber matches. Why would anyone assume that your pay per view is going to be great if you just showcase jobber matches? Mm-hmm. I'm not saying have Tommy Dreamer and Raven on, but yeah, have Tommy Dreamer and Raven on and just do a uh, small finish. There's no reason why you couldn't have, like, Tommy Dreamer and. Sabu against RVD and Raven or something. You yeah. Know, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, so in the end, you know, Heyman wants to fight Lawler and they all get ushered out. It's a bit of a schmoz. So it was just surreal. Like the BWO were in the ring and it's like ECW guys do a WCW parody in a WWF ring. Mm. So it's, it's weird, you know? But uh, no good times. Oh, Heyman was on the payroll, by the way. He would have pocketed 1500 a week. Working for Vince. So. You're serious? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in He's a sly dog, isn't he? <laughs> um, so in the 90s, WWF only snapped up, really, like Mick Foley and Dean Douglas. Like, Vince, and uh, he'd send some green talent to ECW for seasoning, like Al Snow. And <laughs> do you remember Bracus? The name rings a bell. I think he, he, like, he had more vignettes than matches, I think. Because he was, I think he was some German dude. He was just Gary Stridham, a German, wow. German Stridham. <laughs> my name is Bracker. And I come from Deutschland. My Gewicht is 300 Pfund. And when I go to America, to the World Wrestling Federation, come and weder in the ring, I will destroy him. He was useless anyway. Yeah. Can't wait to see this place is spicy. <laughs> Uh, like, it wasn't until 2000 that this partnership would pay off for the WWF, obviously. Um, yeah, three huge staples of this show, Barely Legal, Taz, The Dudleys, and Raven, they'd be working for Vince in 2000. So, how did Barely Legal do? So, you got the endorsement from the WWF, Barely Legal was available to order in 20 million homes. How many buys do you think it did? I'd say about 80,000. Wow. Well, I'm going to say 8,000. Okay. I think we'll aggregate it. Uh, 
they did 44,000 buys. Not bad, not bad. Mm. So, but, you know, that's one in 400 who could order the show did. I think that's pretty awesome. That's n- not bad. Uh, for comparison, WWF and WCWB shows were doing about 100, 120,000 more. Oh, okay. But, you know, um, first outing, I think, well, it was enough of a success that they continued delivering pay-per-views about once every three months um, for the rest of 97 and 98. And for now, that's where our story ends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so before we sign out, let's hit the Douglas is... Cold. <laughs> <laughs> segment. <laughs> Signed over custody, and Michael will never go with you because you're a loser. You've always been a loser! And Mr. Cutler is talking to you. I'm through talking. Well, that does it for this week, folks. Good stuff, Lance? Yep. Terry Funk is champion. Bailey Nigo is a success. And Shane Douglas is still a whiny bitch. <laughs> but what's next for ECW? We will be back next month with ECW's highly touted show, Heat Wave 98. It's supposed to be their best show ever. Oh, so until then, you can watch all of our episodes fuck free of charge in an IMAX flavoured 4 to 3 full screen right here at youtube.com forward slash OSWReviewHD. Subscribe! And why not leave us a lovely note on our Facebook group, OSWReview.com. So it's a goodbye from OSC, hey. V1, yeah. and myself, Jay Hunter. And remember, a winner is you. <laughs> <laughs> to speak to you about your masterpiece. Ah, the wayward flock turns to the shepherd. Uh, yeah. Listen, the administration's a little concerned with the way your masterpiece has been progressing. Concerned about what? You know, some of the things we've seen, quite frankly, disturb us. And we'd like to nip this thing in the bud before it gets, you know, too far out of control. Wait a minute. What are you saying, Chief? What I'm saying is, is I would like to make you an offer. Really? What kind of offer? Two weeks ago, I seen you out in the parking lot of Raw. I know you want back in, Raven. Now what would you say if I offered you the chance to get back on Raw so long as you ended your masterpiece right now? All right. What do I got to do for this if I'm so inclined? Well, you'd have to win a match. It's no problem. You would have to beat the man that defeated you to get you banned from Raw in the first place. Tommy Dreamer. Tommy Dreamer. You beat Dreamer tonight, you're back on Raw. So you're saying, give up my masterpiece, give up my shot at immortality by beating Dreamer, and then I'm back on Raw? I'll do it. <laughs> Good stuff. Oh, it's on! Raven Dreamer tonight! Once again, he will be allowed to 
compete on Raw. At 248 pounds, from the Bowery, Raven! From Yonkers, New York, weighing 230 pounds, Tommy Dreamer! Coach, you know you're gonna miss Raven if he's not on me, and also, we will never know the full outcome of the masterpiece. See, that's why I'm torn. The masterpiece must come to an end. So, in that respect, I want to see Raven victorious, but I like Tommy Dreamer. I never want to see Tommy Dreamer lose, and at the same time, I'm not so sure I want to see Raven back on Raw. So, I'm torn. Here. I don't know what, you I don't know what to, that's for. You have to make he's a little pitiful. He was like in the bushes, in the in the in the you know wayside, just looking of the chance to possibility. Wait, be a on quick robot too, and you know if, if I was Raven, I would want to get this over as quickly as possible. And those are what he's trying to do right now. You know, for Raven, obviously a huge opportunity. Uh, you know, for any superstar, wanting to compete on Raw is the ultimate. And for six months, oh wait a second, here's another quick cover, hook like two, and you're exactly right. That may be what Raven is doing trying to win very, very quickly. These two guys know each other way too well for it to be over this quick. Raven has been relegated to, to heat the last six months, not allowed on Raw, but tonight has the opportunity. Oh! Dropped out of the, he knew that would be the end. If well, he had a taste of the DDT right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tommy Dreamer may want to end this one quickly as and well. he needs business, whoa, coach! Whoa, whoa. Dropping the kill and going with the straight black look. And now Thompson driven to the outside, and Raven quickly right outside on top. And you gotta believe that Raven is extra pumped up here tonight. He's been begging, imploring to get back on Raw, but at the same time to deliver that masterpiece. You know, he's been talking this whole time about how he is his personal playground, and like, you know, it's, this is his show, and he seems to take pride in that. But all the time longing to be back on Raw. Oh, longing to be on Raw. I mean, we wouldn't mind having him on. E oh, nice neck breaker by Tommy Dreamer. Rolls over. Here's a cover. One, two. And a kick out again by Raven. You know, it, it wouldn't offend me to have him on heat every now and then. That would be cool. I'm, I'm cool with that. He could come and visit still, but uh, we can oh, make nice, an opportunity yeah, to be on nice Raw sunset as well. flip and again a two count. Yeah, I mean, just come by and, and visit, say hello, and leave. That's all we need. Here's another cover by Tommy Dreamer, and apparently, this is going to be Tommy Dreamer's uh, plan of action as well to end this one quickly. Right, both men have, you know, interest at stake. I don't know if Tommy Dreamer oh, wants oh. to be hanging out with Raven on Raw. Well, no, that's a good point. Tommy Dreamer knows he's allowed on Raw whenever he wants. And that shoulder end of the steel post, and you can see how much effect that took on Tommy Dreamer. Oh, wow. And Raven, always a smart in-ring technician, taking advantage of that. Get off! You know, Raven has a play to see some less experienced competitors, but tonight definitely even evenly matched. Oh, definitely evenly matched. A guy that he's had a lot of history with, a guy in Tommy Dreamer that they go way, way back. We're taking way oh. 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 Back you, to the EC dub days. Oh, and Raven just taking it to whatever part of the body he can on Tommy Dreamer. Hook of the leg, too. And again, Raven looking for that quick pinfall. Yeah. Oh. And Tommy Dreamer cannot be feeling very good at this point. Seeing a really aggressive side of Raven yeah. tonight. And it, oh. Not a demented aggressive side. And again, going after that left shoulder, hook of the leg too. And As we've Tommy seen Dreamer. before, kind of a demented aggressive side. It's like straight up aggressive tonight. No, uh, he is not messing around. There is no. Uh, playing to the crowd, there is none of that. Raven knows the business at hand. Raven knows what is at stake. No ulterior motives in this match other than trying to get back on Raw. Just needs a victory. That's all that matters. No demonstrations no. tonight. So maybe Raven is not as demented as what we all thought. Maybe not if he's got... Oh! Oh! And again, going after that left shoulder repeatedly too. And again, Tommy Dreamer is able to kick out. Tommy Dreamer's not going to give up easy. He is quite the competitor, has all kinds of heart. You talk about being about as tough as nails. You know, when I think about two guys here in the WWE that may be as tough as anybody, you think about a Tommy Dreamer and a Spike Dudley. You know, all of these type of guys. You think about a Scott Steiner and a Triple H. What a matchup that's going to be at the Royal Rumble. We're only about three weeks away from that as well. And if you thought that arm wrestling match was intense, oh, oh just wait till the Rumble. Oh, 
a special night in the Fleet Center in Boston. Mass Hall! Oh! And Tommy Dreamer with the good arm is able to close on Raven. And again, but you can see almost working with just one arm at this point. A cover one, two, but. Tommy's going to have to regain some feeling in that arm if he's going to want to beat Raven. Right now, Dreamer, as you alluded to, Alita, is, is basically just working with one arm. Oh, and now biting the head of Dreamer. Using one mouth. <laughs> yeah. I like when you say that, actually. Oh! Coach, I thought we were past this point in our relationship. <laughs> well, now Dreamer. Oh! It oh! That's a modified Dudley dog. Use the move as a buddy. Oh! You always got to pay tribute to your peeps. Oh, I always got to your freaks. <laughs> and your peeps. The peeps and the freaks and the peaks and the... And all oh. those guys. They need, oh, they need now, to be represented. We're going for the Death Valley driver, but Raven... Raven oh, hang no! On. Oh, Raven going for the Raven effect. Oh! the foot on the rope. Raven still, even though he was able to get out at a definite disadvantage right now, not having a whole lot left to be able to get the three count on Tommy Dreamer. You got that right. Raven realizes how important. Oh! Tommy Raven. Dreamer moving Charles Robinson no. out of the 